So we've got everybody that uh, I'm expecting. We've got Joy, we've got Kathy, we've got Doug, we've got Jonathan. Donna was with us earlier today. She uh, was at the picture with the bank for the check, uh, but she can't make it tonight. She had another engagement, uh, but she sent me a bunch of emails asking me questions and uh, she's definitely, uh, definitely engaged. Um, <clears throat> so, wow, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, <laughs> but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna kind of make it a little bit uh, fast because um, uh, just because I, I think we we just need to touch on a bunch of things and a, and a bunch of stuff is sort of uh, re resolving itself as we go. So uh, keying into the agenda here, Jonathan, you can hear us, right? I didn't acknowledge oh, you. Oh, Jonathan. Yep. I is can. Jonathan there? Yeah. Hello, there. Jonathan. Hello. Um. So. Uh, so I'm going to start off here, uh, review and approval of our previous meeting minutes. I sent those out the other day. Uh, they seem uh, pretty much where we were at. Does anybody have any uh, comments, questions, observations, alterations? Okay, none. So uh, I'm just uh, make a motion, I guess, to uh, approve the meeting minutes. Uh, all those that are in favor, say aye. 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 All right, so that's all. I don't of know if us. I can vote or not. Uh, you know, I think you can. Uh, so good. our meeting minutes are approved, and I'll send those off to Sherry to have posted on our uh, the, on the town website on our committee page. Uh, item number two is our front projection sign, uh, ZBA meeting approval, and installation schedule. Uh, good news is we were approved. And so our sign is on its way. We're almost, almost, almost there. Uh, there is a 20 day um, period where people can, uh, you know, uh, if they have a disagreement with the ruling um, that they can complain, uh, complain or ask for more information. Uh, so uh, I forget what they call that. There's 20, it's not rescission, 20 day. It's probably not a holding period. It's, it's probably a holding period, not a grace period is my guess. I'm going to call it a holding period just for, okay. So basically a 20 day period uh, where people can file a dispute based off of our, uh, off of our approval. Uh, that 20 day uh, period started on Monday when it was actually filed. And um, so I talked to Gail at the uh, building inspector's office and she, I believe she said it was like uh, February 7th or 8th. Um, and then we can file our uh, building permit. I've notified Bob uh, of the approval and we'll wait till that 20 day period is up. And once I get the go ahead for that the 20 day period is up, uh, I can then um, process and give Bob the approval to send the sign out to fabrication. That'll take uh, probably a month. And then after fabrication is complete, we'll work with the building department and the DPW to set up a uh, install date, which is anticipated to be in March. Uh, <laughs> a couple conditions that came up during the meeting. It was a two hour and uh, 45 minute meeting, or at least my part of it was. Um, I was just there for the last, uh, so it was two hours and 35 minutes to wait my turn. And then uh, it took about 10 minutes, maybe um to uh to get the approval they really uh didn't didn't um you know we've been vetted quite a few times at this point so uh they actually complimented us on our logo thought it was great and i had mentioned how logos are really hard to come across and how we spent a lot of time on it yeah. that caused a lot of chuckling amongst the group they were like oh yeah <laughs> uh amy wall particularly um commented how she liked the design with the arch window and how it brought the architecture elements into it. Uh, somebody else liked the colors. So that was good. Um, the only uh, caveats to our approval uh, were um, if we make any other signage changes, we have to go to them. Um, they want the, the, uh, the LED light range on the sign. Uh, the, uh, the restriction is it has to be between 2700 and 3300 uh, Kelvin, which is how you uh, measure uh, measure the color of light in LEDs. And uh, one of the attachments I sent you when we talk about lights for our building actually shows that and you can look it up. Uh, 2700 to 3300, uh, around 2700 is kind of orangey. 
and around 3300 it's a little more yellowy uh it's a it's a pretty good range it's sort of like a home lighting range and the idea is just to make sure that it's not a blasting spotlight or something really hot or something that would uh come out of um uh, come out of scope with the neighborhood and i believe that on all the signs in the area that's the um, the light range that they um, that they approve for so it's 2700 to 3300 kelvin is our light range and then the other thing they said was uh, have the light off by 11 or if we have an event that extends past 11 whenever the event's over so they want a timer on the light that kills it at 11 with the caveat that we can keep it on longer if we have an event that's going longer. But I told them that that's highly unlikely, but we have, we have that option. And so that was their only request was just to make sure that the light <clears throat> was in that particular range uh, and lights off at 11. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's it for that. So it went basically as smoothly as it could go. The hardest part was the waiting and uh, we got the approval and Bob's ready to go as soon as like I said, I think it's February 8th and, and I'll check with Gail, we'll make sure. But as soon as that day, the order will go in uh, for fabrication uh, because then there'll be, you know, then the, then the ruling or the permission is official, official, official. Um, and so we're looking at a March install date. Does anybody have any questions about the ZBA meeting, the approval, the installation, the sign, the color of the light? the timing, anything? None, but thank you very much for all of the effort and you've probably learned a whole lot about this process. Oh yeah, I should be a paid advisor to people on how to get signs approved <laughs> at this point. Um, and it's changing, you know, I mean, uh, it, uh, they're, they're putting an effort to make it easier. I think down the road, uh, the reason that we had to go to the ZBA in addition to the design review board is because there's a, a rule that says that any projecting bracket sign in downtown has to have uh, permission from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think in the future, for future people, that's not going to be the case. I don't know the exact details, but the Design Review Board, which I went through with um, uh, one of the guys that's a member of the ZBA, uh, Jim McBain, that uh, probably in the future for other people will be the end of the line and they won't have to do this extra step. But this is the process now and we have as soon as february 8th comes and we send our sign to fabrication we have successfully completed it okay so moving on to number three bathroom update so uh part of this is placeholder part of this is informative um the tile update that's still an open issue a lot of other things going on as far as and that's the, when I say the tile update, I'm talking the trim tiles that still need some work. Um, we'll get to that. That's, that hasn't hit the top of the list right now. So I'm gonna keep that as a placeholder. However, we do have new trash cans in the bathroom uh, that I went out and, and acquired. They're the uh, stainless ones that have, have been requested and discussed amongst us uh, over the, the past days and months. They were like 60 bucks a piece, which is apparently what they go for because I looked around. So we have uh, new trash cans. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, new paper towels in our paper towel dispensers. Uh, I also picked up uh, soap and sanitizer. So we've got all that janitorial stuff that we need. Uh, there was a little bit of a question uh, amongst myself and Jamie as we were getting stuff, uh, getting pieces and parts. The soap units are, um, they're, they're kind of like you fill them with liquid and we just weren't sure if they were all that good. Some of the ones have bags that you put in there where like when the soap uh, is empty, you just take the bag, throw it out and put a new bag in the dispenser. These ones are uh, like stainless steel and you pour the liquid into it and uh, that's what's delivered. So that's what we have. Um, and so we just bought the stuff to fill it with and we'll try it out. And uh, if they work great, if they don't work, um, you know, you know, maybe we'll have to look at replacing them with something that's a little, a uh, little more useful. Uh, but that's just really a minutia detail. Uh, essentially, we've got soap, we've got sanitizer, uh, we have paper towels, we have trash cans. So the bathrooms are, are, are looking good and evolving. We still need to, and I'm sure we'll resolve this without any action items that need to be created here, at least at this moment, um, figure out what artwork we're going to put up in there, what our bathroom stuff's going to be, and tighten it up a little bit more. But we've got garbage cans, we've got paper towels. Um, so that's the bathroom update for the moment. Just 
one question. Do you, there's a key to the dispenser. What's that? There's a key to the paper towel dispenser. So there's a key to one of them. There's not a key okay. to the other one. Do we uh, know if the key is? No. Okay. Because I was going to, because it's a the stack of paper have. towels. We do have a key. There's yeah. a stack of paper towels on the back of the toilet. I was going to put it in the dispenser, but couldn't unless I wanted to pick the lock. Um, one of the, the, the bathroom, <laughs> when you look at it, the bathroom on the left, the one that was in the safe, the key to that one has disappeared. Um, okay. the, the key to the other one, uh, the new bathroom, full new construction, that one is actually in the unit and it keeps falling down. I, I've, I've actually stocked it with paper towels and I'll go in and walk out the door and it'll fall open. And, um, the, the right. soap dispenser and the paper towel dispenser are questionable whether they're any good. Um, so it would, could possibly be the same key, though. I tried that. You would think it would be the same key, but it does. It doesn't even fit. And I think I've tried it with you there. Um, okay. But the, yeah, there's there's an issue there, but it's not. You know, it's figure outable. Okay. There's there's the key. There's the the, th the problem was like when the that stuff went in, as well as some other pieces, they just sort of got installed. Nobody told us about it, and they left keys in there. So if someone took a key out of something that was installed and then walked off with it, where is it? You know, um, so one of the paper towel dispensers we have the key for, the other one, the key's missing. It could be found, it might be on a counter, it might be taped to something. Um, mm -hmm. Again, not super high level issues, especially considering the, the loads of stuff that we have coming up, um, very figure outable. All right. Does anybody uh, have any other questions on, you know, bathroom soap, sanitizer? Chris, you'll submit, um, you'll submit uh, receipts for that and get yourself reimbursed, I hope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got a huge awesome. expense report here. <laughs> okay. Um, I have uh, my expense report about ready to go in for all the different stuff because we've bought a lot of stuff um, lately. And uh, that's going in, if not, if not at the end of the week, uh, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, okay, so that is um, <clears throat> that is item number three. Item number four, the rear door project update. Uh, continue due diligence, uh, stairwell options for storage, etc. Uh, so I'll, I'll hit the I'll sort of hit these in reverse as I had them here. One of the things that we found out doing the due diligence on the uh, rear door was that that rear stairwell isn't required uh, for us to have. And um, it came up because since we're moving storage around and we've changed what we call the gift shop is now become storage or it's half storage and half Joy's gallery now <laughs> the way we have it set up. Um, so all that stuff that we used to pile off in the corner where the bathroom now exists um, sort of went in there. And then in the other storage room with the refrigerator and the freezer, um, what do you call it? which I'm sort of starting to call the snack bar because we've talked about and Joy and I talked about this and we'll talk about it more about potentially using that window to make a, to a snack bar over there. Um, so we, we uh, what do you call it? Uh, we found out that, um, you know, we needed to store stuff in the gift shop, the front room. We have storage in the back there, but we sort of lost, lost places for our garbage cans because if we put in the entrance in the back, we can no longer jam the garbage cans behind that door because that'll be an accessible entrance and you can't have two big, big giant blue garbage cans blocking an accessible entrance as a storage area. And so in looking at it and lots of conversations and whatnot, you looking at the stairwell saying, well, geez, do we need this stairwell? Is it required? And I worked with the architects and they said that, no, we don't need the stairwell. Um, it would change our requirements for the basement when we get to the basement. Now, keep in mind, we're not having public admittance to the basement um, at this time. But if we were to invite the public into the basement, we would have to keep the number under 50. And that's not taking into account COVID, that's just general guidelines. So the only reason that that rear stairwell would be required would be if we were having more than 50 people in the basement. Since that's not projected to be anything that's even close to reality for five or 10 years in all likelihood, um, we don't really need that stairwell. And so I, I talked to them and I said, well, what if we, you know, put a floor over that, not demolished it for any reason, because just demolishing it to demolishing it, it doesn't make sense. But we started talking about where the railings might be, 
you know, when the, when the accessible entrance, uh, you know, ex you know, assuming the accessible entrance existed through there. And uh, the idea was just basically, what if we put a floor on top of that? We created, increased the floor path there so that we could put the garbage cans there. So instead of there being basically like a big well, um, if we put a flooring down on there, we could then use that to store our big blue garbage cans in our recycling. So that's something that came up on the, on the rear door. That's the stairwell options for storage. Beyond that, <laughs> we had a conversation and we've been doing the due diligence and there's a lot of um, level changes that need to happen there. We did some measurements and went back and took some measurements over the last uh, couple of weeks. And when you go out the back door and go, uh, when you go out the back of the gallery and then take a left and go out the back door, that step that's there is nine inches. And so that in the first plan <laughs> wasn't really uh, accounted for in a, in a dramatic way. And as, as we've gone through the due diligence process, uh, the architect came back to me and started talking to me about putting a ramp inside the uh, building, which was never anything part of our plans. It would take up, um, it would basically mean that you would come into the door you would take a right and you would be basically up a couple feet as you came into the gallery and then you'd have to go down a ramp in the gallery and that would take, um, it's uh, four foot wide by 20 feet. It would take a hundred feet out of our gallery. And quite honestly, it was not anything that we ever considered. In fact, we said we, we don't want to do that from the get go. So I was a little shocked as to being presented this option, but the reason I was presented the option was because there was a nine inch level change that wasn't accounted for in the initial plans. And in order to do that, that is an easy way to do it. Um, I went back with the architect and I said, you know, that's not gonna work. Um, that just messes up our space. And, you know, that's just, it's not a good solution. It's ugly. It's just, there's a lot of reasons why that doesn't work. The whole point of doing this was to put the level changes and everything outside, which is really, I believe how we've been going about it for the last nine months since we've had these plans. And, and so um, we got on the phone and I said, well, don't draw the, the thing on the inside because I'm pretty sure that's a non-starter and I wanna to talk to the team because we don't wanna spend money drawing something that probably has no chance of ever happening. Um, and <laughs> I said, you know, what's gonna happen out the rear? So they said, okay, we can re-engineer it. And we came back and we talked about numbers and it looks to be a 30 or more thousand dollar price increase to, uh, to do, do the ramp out the back in the way that, that we had originally priced at $50,000. So we got on the phone and we talked about it over the last couple of days. And I said, well, you know, changing this, you know, hold what you're doing. Uh, Cause keep in mind, we pay our architects by the hour and um, you know, hold what you're doing because if the price is going to jump from 50,000 to 80,000 plus that's outside our budget. And then uh, secondarily, um, that's really expensive. And um, it's not, it, it makes it, uh, the, the thing that, and if you read the letter that I sent, sent forward, the thing that really made this work was that it was financially responsible. And as Mike put in the letter, spatially responsible. So it, it met the mark for a bunch of reasons, but when the price goes up 30,000 or more, um, the, you know, that basically really, in, in my head, and, and it's tough to everyone to decide, puts a nail in the coffin of whether it's reasonable for us to do it given our current funding allocations. So we talked about it on the phone and, and I said to Mike, you know, hey, what do you think? Um, and, you know, they can draw it up, uh, but, you know, it was gonna be, you know, at least $30,000, if not more. You know, now we're, approach we're approaching a big boy, a big boy level An $80,000 rear, uh, rear uh, accessible entrance is a lot different than a $50,000 accessible entrance. And so we basically went to that point and I told him to hold. And, and I asked him to write that in summary, which is what I sent uh, to you all today. And so yep. initially I thought we were gonna be here and we were gonna be talking about how this project's been put on hold and how we've decided, uh, you may recall that when I presented to the town council, there was a lot of questions around, um, why don't we do it out front? Why don't we do it with the Envision project? And we had roadblocks there in that I couldn't get guarantees for ramp availability out through the front. Um, well, that was really the big reason why we weren't going towards the front because we didn't know that we, we'd be able to get a ramp there. Uh, whether it looked good or not was sort of a separate issue. 
of, of engineering, but just feasibility wise, it was not something that um, we could be guaranteed that made any sense. Um, so we went back to the back entrance. All that being said, you know, we're talking about a $30,000 price increase, probably at minimum, and it, and it could creep up more. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I've done this enough times now and done enough costing and between COVID escalations and all this drainage work, which they told me was going to have to be put in and, 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 and we were going to have to reestimate. And I wouldn't be surprised if this project went up to $100,000, which is completely outside of our price range. And quite frankly, just isn't that great of a deal unless you're desperate. And so Mike summarized it, wrote the letter. I was expecting to send it to everybody and I was expecting to put this project on hold. I sent it to, I, I blind copy everything to, to everybody to just make sure that we stay in accordance with public meeting laws to just to avoid people doing reply alls. So when you see the undisclosed recipients, it's not that I'm trying to hide things from people, it's, try, it's me trying to avoid a reply all situation. So I sent it to the team, I sent it to Jonathan, and I also sent it to the town manager because this is a pretty big deal. You know, if we all of a sudden put this on hold, I mean, we did an elevator study to make sure that we could do this thing and it was reasonable and that our costs were in line. Um, and then, you know, and then we did an initial cost estimate and we were sitting at $50,000 and everything was still looking okay. Um, and then the new information was, oh geez, you might be up 30 or more, that's not okay. And so, <laughs> you know, that, that being the case, uh, I copied the town manager who then replied back to me and uh, is very interested in that and said that uh, he's, you know, that the, uh, I could read you the letter, but basically he just said that uh, the feelings amongst uh, maybe town council members or people, uh, and I'm assuming it's just, you know, the town council team and the people at town hall is that they really like the rear entrance um, idea. And I think the, the feedback has been because people started thinking about it and like, what would it look like out front? What does a ramp look like on the front of the building? Even if we could get an assurance of the ramp and widen the sidewalk, what does that look like? And I feel like a whole lot more, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot more discussion has happened outside of our committee and with town council members uh, and DPW and other people who are who are party to this um, as to whether it's a good idea or not. And you know. I hadn't necessarily gotten the feedback back until this afternoon at about three or four when I got started getting emails uh, that said that, uh, you know, Steve and town council's very interested in the rear entrance as the, as the way to do this because of the, the blighting and stuff that could happen on the front and, and the challenges that we have there and that he's willing to work with us to figure out ways to fund it. Chris, can I just um, <clears throat> jump in for a quick second? So sure. we actually have not talked about this within town council. So I, I just want to make sure that's clear for the record that we haven't done any deliberation outside of a meeting on this. Um, I do think though that part of the challenge and I'm sure that um, Steve has talked through this with the town engineer and, and the DPW is, you know, well, you know, we know we have an entrance in the front. We also, you know, and we know that there's going to be work that happens there like we haven't really done a full engineering of what it would take to actually do an accessible entrance in the front and kind of the regrading there. And um, I, I think that what Steve was probably expressing is that, you know, a lot of the, the questions that have come up as we've done kind of a reassessment of the entrance in the rear of the building, we'd still have to do all of that due diligence in the front. And so I, I think where um, you know, there's probably more work to be done is just understanding that it's not necessarily a trade off of you know, we spend $100,000 or nothing, it's, we spend $100,000, but if we do something in the front, it might, it might be less, but it also might be more and, and much more involved. And I think that's where, where probably the challenge comes into play. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the other thing that I think I'd like, to, I'd like to add is, is and, and Chris, I think you've got some other things on the, um, on the agenda tonight for like, you know, removal of the area where they used to, where we serve food typically and where they used to take in the bill payments. And, you know, we've talked potentially about maybe not using that center entrance on the front of the building as the main entrance, but maybe, maybe the corner. And then that gets into the whole conversation about usage upstairs, downstairs, elevator, what do you do? What's the cost? And so, you know, I think that this conversation is really interesting because, um, you know, I would also want to really look at not just what would it be for a ramp for that, that's that that entrance on the right, which is in the center of the building on Albion Street, but, you know, what what is the what's realistic for us to maybe 
really use that further up entrance um, and, you know, and is that less costly on the outside, um, you know, maybe more costly on the inside because the impact with the stairs and the walls, et cetera, are, are. but, but I, I feel this is an interesting time that I'm so glad that we've gotten traction and interest and we have options and the town is engaged and Jonathan, you're part of this meeting and I, and I feel like, you know, maybe it's opportunity for us to really step back and, you know, Chris, you've been getting us to do planning and moving us forward, but maybe we need to really stop and assess the interior of the building and where we're really headed from a planning perspective, because I, I think these things all tie together. So I don't know why I've lost my video and I can't, I'm not even going to bother <laughs> figuring out why, <laughs> but here I am. So okay. I, I feel like we should get the cost. I want to know what the price is. I don't know how much more it would cost us to have them work it through, through the back. But I'm really curious because handicap accessibility is never inexpensive. And just because we don't have it in our budget right now, doesn't mean that we can't have a price tag for it. And that says that this is how much it's going to cost to get us to be accessible through the back way because I'm still unsure about what making the accessibility in the front of the building will do to ruin the look of the building, the front of the building, how it looks from the front of the street. I know we need, I know it needs to be accessible. I, I understand all of that, but at what cost? I mean, if it ruins the front look of the building and we can do it in the back, let's at least get a price tag. Okay. Yeah, I don't disagree. So the uh, the email, I'll just read it to you because it's short. It just says, thanks for the update. The feeling is that the entrance should be in the back, Chestnut Street, not Albion Street. The 20 to 30K is short money to maintain the integrity of the front of the building and more aesthetically pleasing to the streetscape. Uh, you know, I'd like to have the building inspect the DPW guys involved uh, need, uh, as we need to consider drainage back there. Uh, and then do we have sketches for the building? And um, so, you know, part of this is, is Steve just got, uh, we, we got the information, I sent it to him because, you know, putting a pause on this is a pretty big deal um, if, that's yeah. what, if that's what's gonna happen. Um, and at the moment, I would say that yes and no. Uh, I'd say that at the moment, yes, because we don't have the plan finished for one. Um, and, and we can continue moving forward on that. And we do wanna get a price from, you know, what I'm hearing is that we want to we want to price this out. I had stopped Mike from doing any work because once I heard a thirty thousand dollar increase, that's beyond our budget. Um, you know, just being fiscally responsible, we needed to bring it back to here and talk about it more. Um, so he he got put on hold. Uh, I have gone back and forth with the town administrator, and uh, we are going to meet in the next couple of days. Um, the DPW, he, he mentioned, you know, DPW building inspector, the town engineer, um, all these people are involved. Um, so he was asking, you know, hey, let's get them involved. They're already involved. They already know about this. Um, what do you call it? So it's good that he's jumping in and, and, and going to work with us on that. So we do have drawings. We do have plans. Um, we're like 90% of the way there. Um, but then when I got this, Hey, by the way, your project costs are going to go up 30 grand, which is 80%, you know, that's a big deal to be like, Whoa, 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 let's stop. So, um, yep. so that being said, um, the funding that we have is unrestricted, meaning we decide the committee decides where we're going to spend it. However, there are lots of pools of funding between the DPW and the town and, and various budgets. We have, you know, 90, $100 million budget in town. So there's lots of places where, you know, where there could be resources that could help us out with this. Um, so, you know, big thing that, that, uh, that I have here is, is I feel as if I need to protect our assets. And once, you know, we, we committed and I persuaded everybody here that, you know, we could allocate, you know, around 50 grand and that would be an okay deal. Um, you know, once you get up to 80 grand, is it an okay deal? Well, in the, in the realm of, is it an okay deal as far as accessibility? Um, that's different than, is it an okay deal? And the fact that us having access to unrestricted funds, um, you know, in the future, you know, getting, we've gotten $200,000 grants. 
the chances of us getting one of those in the near future is, I, I feel is slim. So we have unrestricted funds. We get to decide where that money goes. We've gone through and we've, we've talked about things with Dan Benjamin. I've engaged with the Disabilities uh, uh, Committee on Disabilities Issues. Um, and we've got Aaron working with the state and looking at different funding options. So there's a lot of ways to get the accessible entrance uh, funded uh, without touching our unrestricted funds. So it really is just a matter of, of I think, you know, it costs what it costs, whatever it costs to get it done in the back. You know, it's not like the architect or anybody just, you know, made up something. It'd be great to do a whole drainage thing. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. It's not their fault that the cost is more money. Um, however, in budgeting it and protecting our assets and ensuring that we still have operating expenses and that, you know, we're just not signing away our money, um, you know, we put this on pause. Um, and so I'm going to have meetings with the town administrator in the next couple of days. And we're going to talk about some of those other sources of funding. And uh, I will talk with the architect and I will, I will get the options priced at a, at a bare minimum. We will have everything priced. Um, like I said, I, I paused everything because that was a drastic, you know, $30,000. No, totally makes Perfect. sense, Chris. We all, I think we all understand why. Yep. All right. So I must be repeating at this point. <laughs> It happens. You are. I talk about this stuff yeah. all day long. It gets really hard sometimes. Uh, sometimes yeah. I don't know who I told what. Uh, that's why Let's you tell the truth. Get a price tag. Never change. And what? move on to the next item. All right. Get a price and let's move on. Okay. Uh, well, before you move on, um, so the quite the problem I have is that uh, 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 from the architect, he says some issues appeared that I had not noticed previously. Um, I, I guess I'm just very disappointed that as an architect, he didn't notice that gigantic step that you have to step out of and that that wasn't part of the, the measurements and, and whatnot and, and him designing that back entrance. I mean, that that's a, seems to be a serious uh, oversight. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Doug, we, we'd actually talked about this at some point. I have a distinct recollection of having a conversation at, in some meeting somewhere about about that about that drop. Um, and and I and my take had been, though I can't prove it, was that it had been somehow factored into the 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 costs and the effort. So I'm a little yeah. perplexed myself, but I can't point to anything specific either. Yeah, no, was, I, I think that was our assumption: is that the plans would take that into account because it's it's not a hard thing to miss. It's a gigantic step to get out. So I, I, I'm just, I'm very disappointed that we went through all of this work to, to pick out designs for this back entrance. And and then it's a, oops, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I missed that. You know, there's a, it's gonna change this entire program, the entire uh, process. So, um, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just surprised that uh, he did not notice that step. I share your concern. I, I expressed that concern. Um, I went into uh, a couple separate rooms and did a lot of screaming by myself. Um, I'm definitely not happy about it. I'm trying to learn to be more diplomatic. And so I'll say that I was just presented this information today and I have to handle it. Uh, the text messages that I did say uh, when, when I found this out two days ago, uh, the last text message I have was, I'm surprised that this didn't come up six months ago. If you look at the letter, uh, the letter indicates uh, the architect takes complete blame for it because I agree. Uh, we were told, uh, you know, fairly specifically, and this was pointed out that that was a big deal. And, and, and if th this was going to come up, we would have liked to know that six months ago. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, we, it, we weren't. I'm now told. And again, I have to deal with it. So, um, you know, I, I, I sort of look at these projects like closing a mortgage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes they just don't close. Uh, the, but the point is, we did do the due diligence. The numbers did come back. So we didn't like go to bid. It wasn't missed when he went to bid. And, and uh, it's really hard to get these things through. Um, you know, you could start laying blame in lots of different places. Like, why did it take so long to get, you know, get interpretations and this and that. Anyways, the point is, we know now. 
Um, and, um, you know, and, and he did write a letter and he took complete blame for it. It's not our fault. Never was our fault. Um, and, uh, and I agree with you, Doug, but there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Yep. We didn't lose any money. We just lost time. Maybe. True. Right. Well, um, we, we, yeah, we, yeah. I mean, how, how much was invested in the architect to design what we have now versus the changes he's going to have to make to, um, to, to fix this. Right. And, um, Again, it's one of these things where, um, I, uh, yeah, I was definitely disappointed. However, I feel that we're on the right track at, at the moment. And that, yeah. you know, it has been, uh, you know, it's the due diligence process. It came up, it's a thing. It's not, you know, uh, it's, it's his fault that we didn't find out about it six months ago, but it's not his fault that there's a nine inch, uh, what do you call oh, it? Oh no, and it's not yeah. his fault, but I'm just surprised that, uh, and disappointed that, that he did not find that out or didn't, didn't notice that six months ago when we went through all this work. So agreed. It, I'm just disappointed. Nothing against you, Chris, or, or anything. I, I'm just, yeah, I'm disappointed that um, he, he didn't notice earlier. Uh, agreed. Um, now now we can to speak, <laughs> speak to master plans and things like that was as, so we'll say that we're, we're, we're heading out of uh, number four and into number five. There's a, a, a new architect that's working sort of as part of the team, this guy, Ryan. So Mike is, is doing this and, and uh, we, uh, he had talked to me about the fact that he was gonna help us get this out to bid and then he was gonna go bye-bye and he recommended this guy, Ryan, uh, who's, a, who's a Massachusetts based architect out of Salem. Um, he was gonna help him get it through and get it out to bid to handle these level changes and stuff as we started talking about this, um, you know, very recently. And I actually met Ryan and had him down and we looked at it and he got a whole tour of the building. And uh, I talked to him about master planning on some things and um, you know, master planning on things uh, such as the elevator, uh, such as uh, uh, sprinklers slash fire safety. Uh, and we talked about uh, other items that we have on our list uh, tonight, including floors and um, uh, floors and lighting and uh, where they fall in the grand scheme of things because in our last sort of master plan floors and lighting have uh were you know sort of part of this push and elevator and fire protection is our next big push because both of those items are well over a hundred thousand dollars um and you know the aesthetics of the lighting and the floors which are high impact improvements are much less so uh we talked to ryan about that and we've got uh depending on how our conversations go and if we find some more funding for this bathroom and this project moves forward um, Mike's going to help us with the, with the bathroom portion of it. Once the uh, bathroom, ugh, bathrooms just stuck in my head, except rear accessible entrance. So Mike and Ryan, uh, are the team that are going to help us figure out what's going on with this rear accessible entrance. Uh, let's just say that we're going to do it. We're going to figure out the funding. That's all going to work out. That's a lot of work that I have to do in the next couple of weeks, but let's just say that's all going to work out because I, I have faith in myself and I have faith in, in, in everybody around here. Um, so, uh, Mike will end up signing off after that. And Ryan, uh, I've talked to him about establishing a master plan document to talk about the various things that we have and also have engaged in the conversations of, you know, Hey, we've got this rear accessible entrance, but we also have some floors and we have some lighting, which is in our budget, uh, which was on part of this phase, uh, that we're at, you know, we want to make sure we keep those things on track because, um, those are separate from the rear accessible entrance. And that would be, once we separate from the rear accessible entrance, Mike, our current architect, the lead architect is gonna go bye-bye. And, and uh, unless somebody has a, an issue with it, Ryan, who I can send you his credentials, uh, very well credentialed, has done stuff up in, um, in the Lowell Arts District and a bunch of other stuff. He's got a, a very long and distinguished resume as far as dealing with people like us and specifically public buildings. Um, I may need him to draw some, some stuff for estimates for some of these other things. So we've got a master plan person engaged who's going to look at what we're doing now, as well as look at, you know, sort of the future. Uh, and when, I, when I'm talking about the future, uh, I'm talking more like fire protection, um, fire protection and uh, elevator, because, you know, elevator, we're looking at 500-ish thousand, just roughly. Again, by the time we get to it, it'll probably be 750. Uh, and we're looking at fire protection, which is well over $100,000, where exactly we don't know. Those are much bigger items than what we currently have on the table. 
uh, but Ryan is going to be available to, you know, draw an estimate for this, draw a uh, schematic for that, give an estimate for square footage and, and that kind of thing. So we've got master planning covered, we've got architects covered, um, and uh, I've got meetings scheduled for funding to see if we can keep the rear uh, accessible entrance alive. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so that's number five uh, regarding the new, archi uh, new architect master plans and how he's gonna help with, um, with working on uh, our current rear accessible entrance as to where that lies. So we, we're teamed up as far as, as, far as uh, qualified professionals, we've got them. Uh, so we're, we're good on questions up to this point. There's just so many details of it. And like I said, sometimes I talk in circles, so I need to like ground myself. And I need to pause for a minute because I can't stand yabbling. Let me use a good water here. All right. Item number six, additional hang hanging walls, patch painted and new hardware and lighting options. So we'll start with, uh, we put up my, more, more footage of the hanging system. Uh, the wall over by uh, where the food usually goes, and we talked about uh, the windows there. Um, there was a shelf that was on the wall there. And it, as you may recall, that shelf fell down a couple of years ago when we had the acapella kids were sitting on it and it kind of broke out of the wall. And then we had it reattached to the wall. Uh, and going through and putting on the new hanging system, uh, it, it, that didn't seem to make sense anymore. Um, and a lot of it had to do with if you have your pictures on the wall hanging up, um, you don't want food underneath them or other things that could interfere with that and sort of create a, uh, uh, you know, a line uh, with the messing with the artwork. So we took the shelf out um, and it put it into our storage area, patched and painted the walls and installed the new hanging system. That wall is currently uh, <coughs> featuring John O'Brien's work because we're setting up the new show as we speak. So the wall, the shelf has been moved, the walls have been patched and painted and uh, the hanging system is up and we have photos up there. So that, um, what do you call it? So that is looking good as far as the wall goes. Moving over to um, uh, hardware and lighting options. Uh, so I had a lighting designer in last week on Friday, go through uh, and he works for uh, an electrical distributor so there's a company called Rexel, which is a big electrical dis distribution company around and a local guy that I know works there. Talk to him about lighting designs and just, you know, getting materials and obviously they're, they're a supplier and we can buy from them if we want to. And we talked about the lights in our place and the fact that they're old and that they buzz and that there's a lot of noise and that they flicker and reflect and they're not really the proper lights, um, you know, for, for a gallery space such as ours. They're more like factory lights from 40 years ago. And so we talked about the options to, uh, to upgrade that, to improve that towards a gallery lighting system. So that got the uh, electrical rep over there as well as the lighting designer who sent me, um, he sent me just, I gave him our schematic of what our floor looks like. He's come in, he's seen the spot, recommended various places where track lighting could go, recommended various places where um, general lighting could go. And I've got three different estimates um, <clears throat> for three different versions of hardware to do that. And so the estimates are anywhere from two to 20 grand, depending on what you go with. So the, the, the low end, which is 2000 or so dollars, um, really is just replacing the lights that we have with LED lights, but still using those eight or nine foot long sections, just sort of in place where they're at. Um, you know, not necessarily, uh, in my opinion, where we'd want to go with this because it's still not the right lighting setup. It appears as if uh, a gallery lighting setup has uh, a track component and a flood component. So you have your general lighting for the, for the room. And if you look on the thing that I emailed out earlier, that's where the circles are. And then the track component, which mirrors where our hanging system is. So you've got it up on the ceiling uh, opposite the hanging system. And then you've got spotlights that can hit the various walls. And there's a, uh, a way that you can sort of step through that. You can separate out the general lighting versus the track lighting. And also on the various tracks, you could put in, um, you know, as many or as little lights as, as you wanted to. So I've got, I'm in my possession right now, of not only, you know, the idea of where these lights could go if we were to switch, 
in, in addition to that, I've got three series of three series of estimates. One is a low end, uh, similar to what we have now. Doesn't really change anything. Um, the middle end was was uh, somewhere I think it was eight eight thousand something, somewhere around ten. We'll just call it. And then there was a, another option, which is the ultimate high end one, which is what they first sent me, which I thought was crazy. Not crazy, but we talked about it a lot and I was expecting three options because I told them I come and I talked to the team and I want to present, you know, different options, you know, small, medium and large, you know, a couple different versions. And he sent me this estimate for 20 grand for, to redo the lighting, you know, and, and I said to him, you know, it's, it's not really the number. That's the problem. It's the fact that we don't have the small, medium and large. We don't have three options. We need to know where we land within the, the, the spectrum of lighting as to what these things cost so that we can determine, um, you know, where we want to be. Based off of that, I would say that <clears throat> probably around the $10,000 mark is probably where this project um, would lie. Other things that came up when we were doing due diligence on doors and stuff, um, we potentially could need um, some work uh, on the electrical panel. I wouldn't be surprised if we need a new electrical panel. Uh, just in general, we could potentially, there could be some funds spent on dimmers um, and that kind of thing. With these three estimates across across the board, like I said, it seems like the ten thousand dollar range is probably a good range, unless we have some auxiliary areas or we have some really strong opinions as far as funding goes. And another component that comes up there is that most gallery ceilings are black, um, and it's uh, I believe to hide the infrastructure. And you all probably know because everybody's in the business in some sort of way that's on this on this team. Um, as to more reasons why it's black, but I would consider a lighting project uh, in scope to include painting the ceiling black. Uh, we have white tiles on there now, so they could likely be painted. This requires, uh, you know, a lot more conversation. This is just an initial spec of, hey, here's what the hardware roughly costs. This, you know, involves talking to DPW, going down there with the electrician, showing them our numbers, showing them our various layouts. Um, taking a look at the panels, you know, getting opinions um, from, you know, within our team, our infrastructure team, which would be the town electrician saying, hey, you know, here's what we have. Here's what, you know, here's, here's some options that we've looked at. Here are the types of things. And, and we really need to get that input um, to put that forward. But I think from a general perspective for tonight, uh, because we've talked about it a lot, um, we've had a lighting designer come and look at it. So we have documentation from a lighting designer. I think that's important. Um, we have a range of prices. I think that's important. Um, we have other things that we probably want to include, which is the painting of the, the, uh, the ceiling black. Um, All together, this is a project, you know, that looks like it's between ten dollars and $20,000 when you factor in. Maybe there's a panel, maybe there's dimmers, maybe there's other stuff. And so just really compartmentalizing it of this could be a lighting project um, that we package up a little more formally with more information. Um, the last thing, and then I'll stop talking is, um, as with our front lights, um, these lights also come in various colors. So if we went with 2,700 Kelvin, it would be orange lights. If we went, and we're not restricted on this because we, it's not the ZBA, like the ZBA said we had to be between 2,700 and 3,300 Kelvin, non-negotiable. Inside the building, we could be whatever we want. If you wanted to uh, approve really hot lights, you could um, have the lights, uh, you know, you could go up at 5,000 range, but we get to pick that. I, I've sent you a graphic that sort of explains where that's at. It's not something we have to decide. It's really just information for you to absorb and think about as we gather more information and, and work with the town internal team to get their opinion on this. So with that, I'll say questions, comments. Well, I'm hoping that whatever we pick can be adjusted um, moving forward because it would be nice to have lights that don't hum the entire time that we're in the building. Yep. But we still don't know the ultimate end structure, like the way the walls are gonna go. So it would be nice if we could have something that's, um, that it's we can work with. Thank you. Because I mean, I don't know. I mean, for the old light department building, you got have you guys been downstairs and actually looked at that electrical panel? It's like a it's from a like a horror movie. So it's I don't a even know. Era. 
Yeah, there's a there's a lot of electrical. Uh, so electrical you guys have all panels. seen it. You know what I'm talking about. All right. So the one at the bottom of the stairs is like that's from a horror movie. But okay. There's several panels in the building, so um, this is where working with the town electrician will come in because. I believe the panel that's running all our stuff, and this is just my belief, and I don't know this until I talk to him, is upstairs. And and the you know the a lot of the humming comes from the ballast and the various lights that we have now, uh, as well as potentially the panel. But the panel also comes up in discussion because we with the rear uh, accessible entrance that requires automatic doors, and so those are you know those push button things. So just. First of all, I'm sure, I mean, as a, as a guy that's a former homeowner, uh, well, actually, and a current homeowner, um, you know, I've had to deal with replacing panels before. Uh, it's just something that happens. You know, if your panel's more than 15 years old, they generally don't warranty it. They tell you to get a new one. Um, so the idea that we need a new panel seems fairly reasonable and logical to me. Um, in addition to, like I said, you know, when, you, when you're estimating these things, you know, we've got two, 10, 20. Uh, in addition to buzzers, timers, labor costs, other things that come up. Um, but yeah, uh, it was the light department. They've got, a, there's a lot of panels in there. I think a lot of them are dead. Yeah, the other yeah. thing that I'd like to tie into this goes back to my conversation earlier, which is we really don't know, and I think Joy was hitting on this too, we don't really know the long-term plan for, you know, what are we going to be doing with the, the, the foyer, I'll call it, where you, you know, come into the, the main entrance and where you would, you know, where the panels are, where you would pay the bills, are those walls coming or going? And I think this ties to the floors conversation too, Chris. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if it's time for us to, you know, step back and say, okay, so where are we headed? We've got, we've got some smaller projects, you know, that seem like we can, which would be great to do and affect the look and feel of the place and make it that much more usable. And so I'm all on board with that. But I, I also want us to be really prudent about how we spend our money and looking forward. And is it part of a larger plan? Or at this point, do we cut our losses and say, you know what, 20 grand to go do X and Y, that's a great thing and we get a good return on it because to do the larger thing, whatever that is, is you know, very expensive and so much further down the road. I just feel like we need a little bit more conversation about, you know, what are we doing with some of that interior space? Okay. So then I, I almost wish, Chris, that you had put um, the floor options as number six on the agenda <laughs> and then put the lighting as number seven because I, I just feel like, well, we could handle the flooring but we don't know about the lights unless they could be like movable. If that, I don't know, I'm not an electrician, but you know, so we know the set walls, wouldn't it be great if we could have the lighting on the, uh, the exterior walls that we have now aren't gonna change, but I just don't feel comfortable committing to some big lighting thing that might change down the road. Okay. If, um, so, I mean, actually, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to stop. Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we have had these conversations with Mike, uh, and, and I'm going to continue these conversations with Ryan, uh, and I've actually already had some of them with them. Uh, as far as the lighting and the floors go, uh, inside of our uh, short-term, you know, long-term planning and stuff, uh, well, I can appreciate, you know, taking a step back and, and we'll definitely reevaluate this with the, with, the, uh, with the architects, the amount of dollars involved to effectively do these two things versus yep. um, the range, you know, it's a really good deal for both the lighting and the flooring at the numbers that we have and the fact that we have funding for it. Uh, moving into the future, as far as walls coming down and the foyer and that sort of stuff, I would project that to be five or 10 years out. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a me projection and, and we can do some analysis and, and there's way more due diligence. This is just the introduction of these two concepts tonight as to this is roughly what they would look at and this is gonna go to a bunch more review. Uh, but just from, from a whole, um, I, wouldn't, I, I, would, I wouldn't be scared or I don't wanna say cautious, but uh, 
it's going to go through a due diligence uh, step, uh, doing the lighting and doing the doing the floors are inside the budgets and stuff that we have now appear to be from conversations with our architects, reasonable things to do now if we can get them done and we can get them on a track to being done uh, because of their costs and the costs are only going to go up in the future. Uh, and there's also a ability to um, to pivot. So the flooring wise, depending on how we buy the flooring and how we how we lay it in, uh, if we were to knock down walls, we could compensate for that as part of those yeah. projects. Lighting wise, uh, the components are roughly the same. Uh, the, the track stuff would go against our exterior walls. The interior stuff we're still going to need uh, at that point. Uh, again, fun, given, given where the numbers are at, um, I would say don't be overly cautious. Be cautious. We want to do due diligence. And again, we're going to do due diligence. This is just the first conceptualized written version of identifying these as specific projects. One being, you know, lighting and ceiling. The other one being four, uh, putting them into boxes of things that need to get done. Um, we'll put them through due diligence. We'll ask all those questions of what if we knock down this wall? How does that affect it? What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, the, all those things will be addressed. But again, I would just say, don't be overly cautious, but we definitely, we need to do our due diligence, just like with the, uh, with the rear entrance, you know, we've been doing our due okay. diligence for a while and we're not by and no not, means are we asking I'm not people being to push the trigger. Overly cautious because our exterior walls are not going to change. So, right. I mean, to light up the, like the wall isn't that big of a deal. So I just didn't want you to think that I wasn't for it. Okay. I am for it. <laughs> I'm for better lighting. <laughs> uh, you like yeah. that hum, Joy? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm having a problem with my video, so. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can all see my black and white cutout of myself. This is my, hmm, what am I going to do next phase? But I've looked it up and I'd have to restart my computer to get it to work. So I'm not going there. I don't look that good anyways, because I just had my, whatever, my teeth pulled. So whatever. All right, let's move on to the floor. All right. So in talking more about the floor, so all of these things are going to have more due diligence. We're just putting them into boxes right now. Ceiling, ceiling, ceiling and lights. That's one box. Uh, floor and potentially a little bit of reconfiguration of the floor. That's a separate uh, separate box. And if these things need to go out to bid, depending on how, how the sequencing of it goes, um, you know, they're separate basically bid, you know, bid packages as to figure out where things, uh, things are at. Uh, regarding the floor, there's several different materials that we could use and I've talked to uh, a lot of the vendors about. Um, so it, it seems as if, and, and I've talked to Doug and I've talked to Joy and a lot of people that have been helping, helping out on site, um, you know, it seems as if uh, most gallery floors have a wood plank um, aesthetic to them. And, you know, beyond that, you can talk about how wide are the wood planks, what directions are the wood planks. We've got that wood plank tile that goes between our bathrooms. So uh, based on conversations with various people, including the installer, chances are if we did go with a wood plank design, we would go with it at 90 degrees to the bathroom one, we'd go on the long, the long uh, wall. Uh, the materials that uh, you can have, you can go with tile, you can go with hardwood, you can go with, uh, uh, I think it's called VCT tile, which is a vinyl tile. And then there's a, uh, uh, there's, there's a product by Home Depot that's come up quite a bit called Life Proof. Uh, and um, so, you know, we're really just sort of looking at materials uh, at the moment, or at least, you know, I'm looking at materials to put them in a package to, to show to everybody. The materials seem to be pricing out anywhere between two and five feet, uh, two and five dollars a square foot. Uh, my estimate, and this is something that I'll work with the architects as we talk about, you know, uh, due diligence as to does this make sense and does this prepare us for the future if we do it now and or how do we prepare for the future, meaning if we did a floor now because it seems like it makes sense and all indicators are so, if we were to move forward, would we do things like proactively buy extra floor so that if something changed, we had materials that matched what we had. This life proof product uh, is, is tends to be coming up a lot. Uh, and again, um, uh, the, the product Joy, you sent me, um, 
you, you looked up, it was a pergo based laminate flooring. And yep. uh, so this is something again, that I need to talk to DPW. Um, once we sort of talk about these ideas and th these ideas of different projects and compartmentalize them a little bit, um, then we can talk to them and say, hey, well, what do you think about this? You know, you're our, our local experts on this building. You know, our architect uh, has this opinion, uh, materials look like this. And we're doing a lot of this work and by where I'm saying me, I'm doing a lot of this work here to really accelerate um, our time because, you know, getting pricing and getting people to come down and give you opinions and all that stuff is very time consuming. So I'm sort of saving them a bunch of time slash not putting a bunch of work on them. And once we talk to, uh, you know, amongst ourselves, as well as talk to our architects and put together a package, we're not coming with a, hey, we wanna put in new floors. We're coming with, hey, we wanna put in new floors. And we've looked at 15 different types of designs. Here's some estimates that we have. Here's what our architect says. Here's our rough package. Help us massage this together into something that, you know, we all agree makes sense. So we're really taking a lot of the work or doing a lot of the work for them. And now that we've done, you know, bathrooms and some other projects with the DPW, um, this should put us on a, a much more expeditious path, assuming things pass due diligence. So instead of taking a year, uh, this is something we could probably go through the details in a couple of months and decide whether they make sense or if they don't make sense, they don't make sense. Um, that's where we're at. So I think something I'd throw out there and I know Joy's opinion, so I'll say, I'll, I won't say what I think and Joy, you don't say what you think. What color do you think the floor should be? Anybody? I like nope. the tile that's you that, have that to we wait. Have. It's called wait time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doug, are you saying? Yeah, I mean, you know, I like the tile that we have in the bathrooms. Um, I mean, and I like that look. Um, I don't know what the popular color is to put in these types of things, but what, what yeah, I've seen. I, I, from it, the research that I've done is that, you know, anything uh, from a, uh, a warm cherry, a cherryish kind of, you know, brownish kind of hue to, to also there's the idea of, of matching sort of the wood planks that we have between the bathrooms, something in that similar range, which I included in, in the uh, materials uh, that I forwarded to everybody earlier today. Uh, my thoughts on that, and then I'll, and then I'll stop our uh, I lean more towards the warm wood color because I think it goes more towards the historical aesthetic. Uh, and most of the galleries that I've researched on Pinterest and just looking up, literally just Googling galleries all over the world and all over the country, uh, most of them go with the, with the, you know, like a warm, I guess it might be a cherry-ish. Uh, it's like the, the one that was the Pergo that Joy sent me, uh, uh, that Joy sent me that I sent into the email. Um, that seems to be really what the, what the good galleries have. Um, there could be a case made for some, doing something that's more of the gray uh, distressed look, which we have between the bathrooms. However, I feel that might be a little bit too industrial for our application, but I'm not opposed to it. Yeah, I'm thinking not too light, not too dark, something warm. I, I, I agree that, um, the, you know, the, the pictures of what you sent look nice. I just don't have anything. I don't think I've ever paid to paid attention to floors in galleries before. So, um, you know, we're not the first people to do this. You know, is there sort of a standard, and you know, is there a way for us to find out, you know, what what seems to work best? And and Chris, it sounds like you've done a lot of research looking online. And it's also not just a gallery, though. It's a, it's also you know the. Um, you know, acapella band come in or, you know, yep. other events yep. that, that happen. But yep. um, so yeah, durability. I mean, I uh, as far as materials go, like the color and the materials are sort of two separate subjects. Um, as far as the uh, materials go, the life proof product that is from Home Depot was highly rated because it's their top of the line vinyl product, but it also has really good grip. Um, I've gotten feedback from a tile installer and a few other people that if we went with tile like we have between the bathrooms, that that might be too slippery and too easy to damage. Um, people drop stuff, people bringing stuff in and out for, for events that we have, 
you know, if the acapella group comes in and they drop one of their amps on the floor, are they going to shatter some of our tiles? Um, could happen. Um, the LifeProof product has been considered the most durable and slip resistant was the big deal on that one. Um, the Pergo laminate, which is uh, the cherry one that I sent, sent to you all, I don't know what the durability on that is. I think there's probably a good fight, uh, but I think it's probably less durable than the LifeProof stuff. But again, it was really, you know, at this point, it's just a matter of, hey, floors, um, hey, materials, hey, what do they cost? You know, so this is just really just data gathering and putting everything into buckets. And then, then once we get them in the buckets and have some more time to massage them and get opinions from, from our internal team at the town um, and, and a little bit more vendors, um, we, can, we can make a material selection. I, from what I hear, you know, it sounds like most people are going to talk us out of tile because of durability and slippage. Um, and then maybe the laminate, the pergo laminate stuff, that might be too residential. Um, so from what I've heard, and, and, and it's by far not definitive, it's just based on what I've heard in the last couple of weeks, um, this life proof product is, is considered a winner. Now, when I tour this with uh, DPW and, and Ann Waite and, and, um, and, and maybe some other members of, of the staff, um, they may have a vendor and or other products that they recommend. Uh, but the bottom line is no matter what product we use, which we're not at that point, um, you know, we want to make sure it's durable. We want to make sure we have enough extra if we have configuration changes. So if we knock out a wall and we need to reconfigure the floor, we want to make sure that we have some of that lying around so that they're like, oh, sorry, that's been discontinued. We don't want to have any of those problems. And I've had that happen. In, in home projects that I've done before, where if you don't buy all the stuff, like especially with tile, if you don't buy all the stuff out of one lot, mm, mm, sounds like our bathrooms, um, you can end up with problems. So I don't know if there's anything more to say on that. Uh, you know, I'll uh, put the floor open to, does anybody else, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan, I don't know if you've said anything on, on this one or whatever, but have any opinions on uh, that they'd like to share with us about flooring? Uh, and, and then lastly, I'll just say that uh, it sounds like everybody likes the idea of floorings and that I should keep working on it, keep it in that bucket and develop it out more. And if, yes. if somebody disagrees with that, let me, let me know. I don't think it's anything we need to vote on or anything, but I'm going to keep pursuing it. Um, but I want everybody to have at least an opportunity to, to give an opinion as I continue to pursue it. Well, uh, Chris, one thing that... Um is worth mentioning that um, you had uh, mentioned to me was that when you had the flooring guy in um, the safety issue of what we currently have now, you know, there's, there's uh, with the multiple seams and whatnot is, uh, you know, we really need to do something about that. It's not just a look there. There's a safety issue. Agreed. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. That, that was, that was a big point. And, like I said, there's so much stuff that I have on this agenda. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, we didn't talk about that. I, I, think, I, think, it's, I think it's in writing. So I think I sent it to you in writing. Oh yeah. Okay. On the floor yeah. thing, it says, so that was a big thing is that we have in between the doors or that was a big thing. In between the doors, our uh, thresholds are all pulling up. We have sharp edges all over the place. Um, in the main floor of the gallery, we have five different seams and part of our floor is being held together with duct tape. Yeah. Let me say that again. Our floor is being held together with duct tape. And there's actually a hole in the floor awesome. that you can see through to the basement that I put a cork in because some lady got her heel stuck in that hole. Yeah. So, you know, so as much as it's an aesthetic thing and that we like the look of it, it's really a safety thing, you know, and especially yep. when we're talking about master planning and budgets and stuff like that. I mean, I think it really you know, is at the top of the list in that we've got safety concerns uh, in the doorways too, the thresholds and like going to the basement uh, and a few of the other ones, the guy pointed to me, they have these rubber things that they use for thresholds now. So that if somebody falls down, you know, they're not going to get, you know, a, a piercing or a cut or a slash. They're just going to fall down and bounce off the rubber thing. Um, we literally yep. have pieces and wires and I've got cuts all over me of, yep. of, of things that are just tagging into me. So Chris, Chris, I, was just I think say moving forward with, with, I'm sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say on the safety piece, I, I think that's a really good point that Doug made. And, you know, not only as you think about flooring and lighting, is that a way to kind of dramatically improve the aesthetics for relatively short dollars, but 
you know, as we're talking about an accessible entrance and things like that, I, you know, it, you really can't have an accessible entrance into a building where you've got, you know, seams and trip hazards all over the place. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think the path that you're going down and, and sort of the due diligence that you're doing here makes a, a ton of sense. Uh, another thing is there's telecommunication ports all over the floors. Mm -hmm. So if you go around there, and they were for the old, uh, the old uh, mainframe, well, it was a mini, it was a deck mini that was in there. Um, so yeah, those just, you know, the RJ 45s or the phone cable things or whatever. Uh, there's a bunch of those all over the floor that you can trip at. And then just rolling back to the lighting thing. In addition to that being an aesthetic thing, the other big thing, which I think will ring well with, uh, with some folks in town is uh, it's ecologically friendly. So, I mean, it is the green way to do it. So our lights and our electric, quite honestly, is a nightmare. It's a safety hazard. Um, and when you turn on those lights and they're buzzing, they're using tons of power. We're not getting the light that we want. You know, it's, it's ugly. And so, you know, in it, so for safety reasons, because ballast blow, ballast catch on fire, Old wires catch on fire. Old fire boxes catch on fire. These are the these are the reasons why you have to end up replacing panels is because of fire hazards. Um, but the light itself uh, is ecologically uh, friendly, so we'll be using less power and we'll be doing it in a in a very green way, which I know is important to a lot of people in town. So we'll be greening up our building. So Chris, I was just going to say, you know, we're, we're headed as as Jonathan just pointed out, you know, definitely prudent things for us to be pursuing, and so I, I don't think anybody has any reservations about moving forward with the, either one of these, you know, exploring these and and trying to get some real traction on them. Awesome. All right, one more time. Anybody uh, have any comments on five, six, or seven? Okay. Uh, the, the, the snack bar window modification. Yep, yeah, we didn't talk about that. I, I don't know what that is. So this is a concept that uh, will come up again in due diligence. Um, but the window that goes into our current storage room uh, that's there when we had been doing some brainstorming as we moved the shelf and opened up that wall and, and got our hanging system installed there. Uh, we were talking about removing the other, the peninsula that's that's in that area too because we've got a whole wall now that you can see things and that peninsula is sort of an area where people get stuck we usually put food on there and then if you're behind there usually you get stuck in there so if we're going to do floors you know the rug is actually around that peninsula and we took out that peninsula so that is that is an area where you can then walk over and look at the wall and stand in front of it um, there'll still be some counter space potentially for food but we were thinking that in the back where we now have the chairs, the refrigerator, the slop sink, there's that window that could be easily turned into like a snack bar or a food distribution area where we put a counter on that window so that instead of all the food being towards the front, um, assuming let's say we did the floors and we took out the peninsula, we could then put food over going towards that back storage room and then uh, and that has the refrigerator behind it. It has a sink behind it. It has the tools that you would need to have. And, and uh, it was, uh, I forget who came up with the term, it might've been Joy or, Joy, did you come up with that one, the term snack bar? Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> so we, we said, oh, well, you know, maybe if we do our new floors and we do some new lights, you know, where would people go for the food? If we put a counter on that window, which goes in that, that uh, looks into that, that back room, which is just kind of weird how that ended up like that, but it's there. Um, you know, not only is it the proper place because there's refrigerated back there. Somebody came up and they wanted drinks or ice or something that we needed. You can access the refrigerator. Um, that could be a, the, a secure area for for a coat room, which is what we use it for a lot. Um, and uh, you know, basically, you could put the bar stools that we have over there, and that could be the new area where food, uh, you know, food is available when food is allowed you know, when we get past the pandemic and all that sort of stuff. So not and, necessarily and, an immediate thing, but the idea and that when we, get, when we get past that point, it also would make it easier to present the food out as opposed to going into that back room and trying to fight your way through the crowd to get it over to the other part of the room. It would just make it that much easier for the person who is presenting the food to just bring it onto the other side, right outside of the window. 
Well, we can always put food on tables too. So it's not like we need a, a peninsula all the time to be there. So if we wanted food over there, we could always throw a table. So right. I, I, yep. I'm, I'm for removing the peninsula. And, and there's plenty of room on the counters there too. Even with the peninsula gone, there's plenty of room on the counters. Yep. And the idea yep. of a snack bar is just an idea. It's not like I'm not putting it in a big giant bucket like I am floors and lights. You know, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, we could probably do that. Now in the interim, we have installed a hanging system over that window. And uh, I think in the next couple of days, Joy is gonna put in uh, some Luon that covers the window temporarily. And by temporarily, I mean, just, you know, whatever, a year or two or three or whatever, just Luon, real thin stuff. Um, so that we can use that as another display wall while we're figuring things out. So right now it's got curtains up that block it so you can't see into the storage room. So when you go by, it just looks like an ugly wall. Um, we're put the Luon over it with a coat of white paint on it, then it's just gonna look like a wall. We've already installed uh, courtesy of Doug, which by the way, big round to Doug because Doug did all the install of all the hanging systems and he's been in there several times doing yeah. that. Um, so we've got that. So uh, we'll get into talking about the show because that's a space that I need to fill. Um, but yeah. And be great to be able to uh, remove those tablecloths that we have actually hanging up inside in that room to be able to use them for when we need them for um, for events and exhibits in the future. Right. Uh, yes. On the note of tablecloths, all the ones that were around the peninsula and were yep. around the shelf that we took out to make the wall yep. right, uh, I've yep. taken those and that's part of my big expense report here. And I had those laundered at the Crystal Laundry or whatever down the street. Oh, you rock. Wow. So they're Great. all cleaned. They're all folded. They're all sitting there waiting to be reinstalled. Uh, part of the pieces and parts that I bought while we were setting up the show, uh, we have a new staple gun. Um, what do you call it? We have, we have a new staple gun. We have a new hammer. Um, We've got paper towels, we've got some tools, we've got a big toolbox in the back storage room that we bought to put all our stuff in. It's got a lock on it. I'll say it here in this public meeting. The lock is a combination lock. The combination is one, two, three. <laughs> For now, unless we decide that that's it. But it's just, it's just the idea, you yeah. know, that we're just not leaving all this stuff out so that it can walk out of the building. You know, like yeah. I said, we've got, a, we've got a staple gun, we've got staples, we've got the hanging system you know, the hanging system pieces and parts are in this toolbox because they're expensive. Each one of those little hooks that we have on the wall is, oh man, they were $6.80, but I think they're $8 on the last order or whatever. Those things are expensive. If a handful of those things walk out the door, that you know, we lost 50 bucks. So, you know, those are locked up now. They're either being yeah. used or they're locked up. I'd rather not put the tablecloths back up. I'd rather actually get some fabric or something. I mean, that that's something that we could do as a separate initiative at some point. But those tablecloths aren't, you know, aren't cheap either, and you know, are definitely have a use. So we'll have to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. For now, they're they're cleaned, laundered, folded, and Thank sitting you. in a nice clean bag. Um, and and like I said, we've got the um, we've got the staple gun and and other stuff. Uh, Joe, you used the staple guns. It work all right. You did right to do. It the works team. great. Yeah. Did you notice that? <laughs> well, I, yeah. Uh, Jamie noticed it, and she said to me, "She's like, so look, someone already used it or whatever." And I go, "Oh, cool." Because I mean, you know, it was again small, medium, and large. We could have gotten the super cheap one. We could have gotten the super expensive one, and that one was like ten or twenty bucks, and so we got that one. No, because I was using that to try to figure out how to hang my photos on the hanging system so they weren't floating around so much. Yeah. So I, I can, I, I'll, we can talk about that when I see you guys that I, I stapled the back of my pictures and then I threaded the, the wire through them so they weren't so, because my pictures are light. Yeah. So they weren't floating around. So I think that I've I've tried to, to start to figure out a way to anchor the photos on the hanging system so they don't tilt forward. Yep. Oh, great. So. And that was something that uh, that Doug helped out with as well because um, we we well we had Anne Marie's photos if people recall were were really hanging forward and we had to have to fix some sawtooths on that and other things. But just in general putting stuff on the hanging system has been a learning experience because I've used it, you know, everyone else has used it. And it's, it's real simple to say, oh yeah, you just push the thing and push it up and down. But yeah, then when you 
a wall of 30 photos and they're all crooked, you know, you learn things like Doug hooked me up with this concept of using an S hook in there to help straighten things up and you can use little pieces of wire. And there's all these little tricks that make it really work because otherwise you're like, wow, we have this awesome hanging system and I'm so frustrated. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta go through the pain. All right. So Joy, you've learned your tricks on the hanging system too? I'm working on them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So now we're on to number eight, event review, new beginnings art show, uh, January through April. So as far as the setup status, um, I have gone out and uh, part of the expense report here, uh, we, have, we have a thermometer on site now. Um, we have masks on site. I, got, I started with 50, a, a box of 50 masks. Uh, we bought a sanitizer station for when you go in and that's something I'm gonna talk to Doug about uh, installing. Um, so it's just, it's a touchless sanitizer station. It was like 50 bucks from Staples. Basically, you just put your hand under it, and if it sees your hand under it, it's battery powered. It'll spit sanitizer on your hand, and you can you can rub your hands together. Uh, masks, uh, as well as a thermometer. The guidelines that I've researched and found out are because now that we have a thermometer, it's like okay, well, when do you boot somebody? You know, when do they when when do they get flagged? Like when do you say they have their temperatures too high? And apparently, 100.4 degrees and above is what the internet says. No go. So most people come in apparently low, you know, 98.6 is what I've heard my entire life, but um, I keep coming in um, a little bit uh, like a, a degree or two below that. Uh, but my specific thing that I wanted to know was, you know, what's the number? Great. We take everyone's temperature. You know, do we boot them out at 99? Do we boot them out at 100? And the consensus from the internet seems to be 100.4 uh, and above um, turn away. So thermometer, masks, sanitizer. Uh, Chris, just to just to validate that, so you know we're not just kind of pulling numbers off the internet. But I, I you know, I work at a healthcare organization, and that that is sort of the 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 temperature that's considered a, a fever when we're screening people coming into a clinical site. So just so we're not kind of you know making up numbers that we find on the internet for. Uh, I mean, everything on the internet isn't true. I know, shockingly. <laughs> That was, you know, that do, do we need right. what is the town's policy on posting signs in regards to for town buildings in regards to wearing masks is that something we need to do something about overtly for any of these events um so i i, I think I, I don't think there's a specific town policy other than that we're we're following sort of state guidance guidance on Okay. um you know mask wearing and so forth so I, I i would probably suggest that there's kind of a, a sign that goes you know in the front with the hand sanitizer in the you know in the in the thermometer so that you've got you know kind of clarity on what what your requirements are okay. as people are coming in i would say right, our policy is masks on yeah you know? yep. um, yeah and i and i don't i mean for the the timing of this show i i fully anticipate that that's still going to be the the state policy as well yeah We've got the, uh, the masks on, we've got that. Um, we took the, uh, so uh, the, the PPE and the sanitizer and all that stuff is, you know, funded slash deferred or whatever. Uh, the savings bank uh, gave us the check for $500. I actually got that today. Uh, I think it's probably further down on the agenda, but I'll just mention it. Uh, Doug, Donna, who's not with us tonight, uh, and uh, Eric were in the photo. Uh, Eric Escadel, who's in the exhibit. So we had Eric, Donna, Doug, two people from the bank. Uh, Ann Hadley took pictures because she does some uh, PR for the bank. I took pictures, so I'll go through that. I'll post it to our website. Uh, actually, I'll post it to our Facebook. I'll send it to Doug for our website. We'll talk about that later because uh, Doug's taken over the website. Um, and so, yeah, so we've got plenty of money for PPE, masks, and, uh, you know, if we need to, I, I don't think we need more than one thermometer. If for some reason we do, we've got the money to go buy it. Uh, I've got a big giant thing of hand sanitizer. Um, I ran it through, <laughs> I ran it through the internet and it says that it works. Uh, not one of the bad ones. And um, so, so we're looking pretty good there. Um, something that came up uh, as we're going through, oh yeah, there it is, savings bank picture with the big check. That was right there. Uh, so that, that's covered. Um, something that came up that I just want to throw out for people to think about 
um, as we were starting to, to populate the wall. So like Eric has the wall. If you walk in the building on, in the back left, John uh, O'Brien has the wall behind the counter uh, and behind the windows. Uh, so in the front left, um, Joy's on the sort of back right. Jamie's on the back of the bathroom. We've got the snack bar wall. But we've got all these different display walls now, especially now that the hanging system is up. And, and they're, they're definitely definitive places. Like there's the front one, there's the back one, there's the, you know. So the idea uh, that I just want to shoot out there for, you know, thought, thought uh, process, uh, and, you know, thinking time while you're in the shower is maybe we should name the walls. So like, let's say you go in and Eric's on the back wall. So you go in, you come into the gallery, he's on the back left wall. And that was the, the really hard wall to put the first hanging system on. Maybe that wall gets called the corner power wall or it has some sort of name that we come up with. And then as we go from this always on state where we've got artwork on all the walls, well, maybe when this show sort of starts to end, we decommission one wall and we say, hey, all right, we're gonna put something new on there. And I've got some ideas down there, but let's just say we have a photo contest of some sort and we pick you know, a handful of winners. We could then say, hey, come down to our, our, our place. And if you go onto the Quanta Powett wall, you can see all the winners of the 4th of July photo contest. And we give them an actual de dedicated uh, individual place. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, a good, good idea, bad idea, you know, naming the different walls. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> Think about it. I'll bring it. I'll bring it back up uh, in in the future. It just it, and it's for a descriptive thing too, so that if if we're sitting here and we're talking and I say, "Hey, blah 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 blah," and I start to identify it by you know the snack bar wall or the this wall, we can just talk in very specific terms. Kind of like when I got corrected by the 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 Commission on Disabilities Issues when they told me that I can just start calling entrances accessible entrances and I didn't need to butcher it every time that I said it because I would one times it would be a handicap entrance the next time I'd say it needs to be an ADA entrance I gave it all these different names but I meant the same thing definitive placing of you know the front blah. or it could be boring it could be wall a b c and d uh, just to throw another thought out there I mean is is that an opportunity to also to think about a fundraising opportunity you know would someone make a donation for the you know Carino family wall or you know whatever Whatever way. Great idea. Mm. Oh, yeah, wall sponsorship. Yep. They could definitely be sold off, you know, or sponsored off. You know, there could be the there could be the savings bank wall, uh, the co-op wall, any 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 of those things are possible. It's definitely, you know, we're a creative group. Um, food for thought. Uh, for now, we'll just keep just doing our best. But um, in in a future meeting. I didn't know if you were holding up a sign there, Kathy. You oh, no, sorry. It's back just, your thing. It looks no, like no, no. I'm just writing on the, I'm looking at the agenda and going back and forth. No. Nope. I'm waiting for you. It's like, is she holding up a sign that says need help? No. <laughs> God, no. <laughs> Are you trapped? Are your parents keeping you here without your permission? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so... Anyway, so we're, we're really coming along as far as the setup goes. We've got space, uh, like they said, that snack bar wall. We've got some space. We need to do some adjustments on some other stuff. We need to figure out, um, and this is something we don't need to do in a meeting because, you know, I'm seeing Doug you know, almost every day now. Joy, same thing. Kathy, you know, you've been in there. You know, we're all seeing and talking to each other offline as far as getting this thing to a point where it's set up. But I'd say that as far as setup goes, I think we're like 60% of the way there. Um, in another week or two, uh, fill in some spots, fill in some spots on the floor, um, figure out some dates and I'll put that stuff together uh, and, and I'll start working on some of the media. Uh, as of like, you know, a week or two ago, we had a lot of art in the building, but we still had hanging system that needed to be installed. That's been done. Doug's taken care of that. It's pretty much, uh, I think all of it's done or really close to all of it. Um, that we worked with the hangers. We figured out all that stuff. We took out a shelf. We painted some stuff. Uh, Joy brought in her vacuum. Uh, we got rid of, <laughs> we threw out five, four or five dead vacuums. We were like the vacuum morgue um, that, you know, so we, 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 we need to get a vacuum coming up. Uh, I may end up buying us another one, but for now, Joy cleaned up the, 
the gallery. So, you know, between wall repairs and stuff that was left over from construction, the building looks really clean. And yeah, we could wipe it down more, but if we opened up, people wouldn't say this place is a mess, you know? And, I, and I'll send some photos out and I've been sharing them via text with a lot of people. You know, we're, we're starting to look good. I think we're 60% of the way there. We've got all our PPE. If we had to open tomorrow for some reason, we could. We've got all the safety stuff. Uh, we've got stuff on the walls. We've just got some empty spots and some floor space to fill. And then we can just start, book, we can start pre-booking admissions. Uh, so, uh, as I said, Chris, we'll if, you, if you want some floor space filled in, I could do, I could do, um, you know, some three-dimensional felting, but I, I don't know if that's in the scope of what you've got. Um, so uh, not pushing to get in. I've got lots of other stuff going on, but if, you know, you're looking for something, let me know. We can take that offline. And, and the answer is yes. And yes, let's do that. We've got a, the okay. floor is the floor is empty because because we have the wall hanging system now, everything's on the wall. We used to put up those those metal things and those cubicle yep. walls, and we don't have to do that anymore. It's kind of cool. Um, so yes, yes, we want that, and and I think Doug has some stuff, and we're just going to keep filling it in uh, sooner rather than later because uh, I'm trying to get you know everything set up in the next week or two. Um, we're definitely going to have at least a couple opportunities to come in in January. The show says it's running from January to April. I guarantee you I will have it ready to go for at least a couple slots in January so that we make that mark. Um, and like I said, we're, 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 we're pretty much there. We wanna fill in more. Um, Joy, you're working on some signage too, right? Joy? Oh, lost her. Did we lose Joy? Might have lost the audio. Um, Anyways, we'll continue to talk about that. Some signage. We want to have little descriptions of the artists. Um, I need to put together, like I said, some media. We need to, uh, I've uh, had a couple conversations with the item. Uh, ideally, I'd like to get them to do features on everybody or many of the people that are in the show so that, you know, maybe once every, every other week or something, maybe they talk about Eric Escadel one week and just remind people that there's opportunities to go there. And then in two weeks, they talk about John O'Brien. They run an article about him. And then in two weeks, they talk about other people so that we can have a media partnership with that. All that stuff, totally possible. I've just been real busy doing the other stuff. And that's what's next on my list is to get the media together. Um, future event ideas. And I'm just going to blast through these so that it's 8.30 now. Uh, and we've got two other things. So I don't want to keep us too long. Um, Lake Corner Power Photo Contest or a follow-up show to our Lake Corner Power Photo show, which was very successful about two or three years ago when we did that. And we met some, some new friends that are still with us and people that are in the Arts Collaborative. Um, so I definitely want to work on Lake Corner Power Photo shows, either similar to the way we did it before, or maybe we'll run a contest. Um, Wakefield item, I've talked to Mark Sardella and I'm uh, supposed to talk to Glenn Dahlbear, the owner of the paper, um, but I pitched to them the idea of doing, uh, you know, they're 126 years old or something. And I said, why don't we do an exhibit? And this could be an exhibit on, you know, like one of the walls, like I said, where we could do, uh, you know, classic Wakefield daily item photos or classic Wakefield daily item front pages going back 126 years. So in that back left wall where Eric's stuff is now, that could have, you know, the 10 or 20, you know, most dramatic Wakefield item photos in the last 126 years, um, or just something there. And establishing our partnership with, you know, the, the item, which is a major media provider for town. Um, and so we really want to, you know, be connected with them. Like we're connected with the Arts Collaborative, we're connected with various groups, um, partner with the item on that. And so I'm, like I said, I'm scheduled uh, at some point to talk to Glenn Dahlbeer about what we can do to uh, do some exhibits with the item like that. Classic front pages, classic photos, or some idea that they, they might bring. Um, there's the potential for Wakefield History Museum features. Um, you know, they do the burial ground uh, tour and a lot of stuff in the fall. You can talk to Nancy Bertrand about that. Uh, there's also potential for, um, oh, was there's one other thing that we could do. Oh, uh, uh, July. The, the, the parade people, uh, the parade and the 4th of July, we could do a, yep. a contest around that. Um, and I would say the 4th of July in general, not just the parade, we could do maybe this year, maybe not, or it could be post depending on how, it really depends on how we structure it. 
um, you know, minutia for another time. But the idea of, you know, hey, maybe it's a contest where everybody takes photos on the 4th of July and then we feature the 4th of July photos in August and we have a whole wall that's the 4th of July one. Or maybe next year it's before the 4th of July and it's a combo fundraiser together. But using these walls, big smiles, Kath, I love it. Did I do something? No, no, I just, the, the, the brain keeps going. <laughs> that's all good stuff. And I like um, the interaction with the town and it's arts oriented and it's ways to get people in the building, all good stuff. So there's all I, I was gonna say, Chris, I, I love the fourth of July idea too this year, given that you know we're not having the parade and the West Side Social Club's not doing their fourth activities. I, I think if there's something that we could do that is interactive, uh, that kind of commemorates the yeah. holiday and maybe also sort of tie into potentially a fundraising opportunity for the, the 2022 parade. I think there'd be, I think that's a real nice tie in, and I think that would draw some people to the building. Cool. Yeah, I, I, classic 4th of July photos. I mean, we're, we're, I'm looking at this show January to April, but it's going to transition, you know, April, May, or something like that. So maybe, maybe, maybe that, you know, is something that could potentially be sooner where we either solicit photos. And again, we got to go through the details. If we can come up with something that makes sense with the proper lead times. And that's always been the, the key to the, uh, the success of our projects is to not rush them and have proper lead times because these shows just don't just come together. You know, there's a lot of work. We've been working on all this stuff for a couple of weeks. So, um, but yeah, classic 4th of July photos, parade photos. Yeah. So those are some ideas I just wanted to spit out there. Um, does anybody else have any other ideas that they want to share or that they want me slash Kathy to track by putting them in our documented notes. Okay, uh, moving on to number nine. Um, I'm gonna send this over to Doug uh, and Kathy for various portions, but um, we have updated the website. It is not completed, but we changed our, um, I, I went through and I did sort of a redesign of our navigation and, and, and selected some photos that were classics that, that seemed to look good online. And, and working with Doug, um, we took our website, I, I redesigned it um, and, and we made it look better. But then we just started looking at our infrastructure and our costs and our hosting and that sort of stuff. And we have since moved our hosting to Amazon Web Services, AWS, the stuff that runs Amazon. Um, and um, our hosting for the first year, believe it or not, is gonna be free. Um, so we were paying $300 a year, uh, roughly $25 a month, plus our domain registration, which comes in around $20 a month, which is considered a very good deal. Uh, in the a year, right? But uh, we redesigned it, got it nice. Doug went through and did all the heavy lifting to get the Amazon account set up. And I basically handed him the keys to the kingdom and he took the, the, the redesign and then continued redesigning it more and put it on Amazon web hosting. And uh, we still have updates to do, but uh, Doug, take it away. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> like Chris had mentioned, it's uh, switching from um, our, our current uh, hosting platform to something that's a little bit, that we have a little bit more control over. And, um, and in the, you know, it's incredibly fast and uh, especially for the price that we're, we'll end up paying after our, um, our, our tr um, trial is uh, completed is uh, we'll, we'll be spending less money, but we'll have uh, more control. We'll still have to pay that um, yearly $20 for um, the domain name. Um, but other than that, um, it, it's still, uh, it, it, it will end up costing us less. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, like Chris had mentioned, we talked about um, some of the future expansions and, and, you know, we still need to update some of the wordings and, and whatnot, but uh, <clears throat> I think we have a good infrastructure at this point to, um, to add new features on without making it too complicated. And then in, in addition to that, talking about these projects that we have uh, and something that I'm going to actually ask Jonathan, because we've started a little bit of an email conversation. It's going to take a, probably a little bit longer to go. Um, any of these projects and other projects that come up, if we segment them off and we have them um, defined, you know, we can go out and actually solicit donations for um, specific projects. So if somebody wanted to donate to us, 
you know, they could just make a general donation to us um, or they could go towards a specific project. But one of the big problems that we're finding right now, at least that I find, is that it's too hard for people to give us money. Um, you know, if somebody wants to donate to us, it's just simply too complicated. Nobody carries cash anymore, nor do I really want to carry cash. Um, and, you know, the places where people are going are the digital payment currencies, you know, the, the Venmos of the world, the PayPals of the world. There's a few other, but Venmo and PayPal are, are some of the most, most common. And in many uh, organizations and situations, if you look through these vendors, they have abilities for um, town-like entities and nonprofits and, and other places to be able to accept money, it's a special program. Uh, not a special program, but it's, you know, it's a specific program within, within their, their business relationships area. And so with our new website, we wanna make it so that people can actually just click and donate. And there's a lot of research I've done on, on Venmo fundraising campaigns. Um, everybody seems to have Venmo these days, where if you say, hey, do you wanna throw $10 at whatever it is we're doing? Um, and we give them a code, they can click on it and click, click, and we've got the donation. Right now, it's, you know, you're going to write us a check, care of the town of Wakefield. Then I'm going to have to take it down to the accounting office. They're going to throw me out and tell me to go to the treasurer's office. The treasurer's office is going to hand me a deposit slip and tell me I need to go to the bank. It's just way too hard to deal with our money the, right now. And so, um, you know, it would be really good, um, but new to do it via Venmo and PayPal and these other things. And it's, it's a project because it's new, it's definitely doable. It's definitely legal. We are allowed to accept money. Um, Jonathan had a question on that as we talked in a different uh, email thread, um, but we just really need to get the motivation amongst the parties that can help us make it happen. Um, the accounting department uh, doesn't do this now. And a lot of towns accounting departments don't do that now. A process needs to be created. It's new. It's not scary, but things that are new are scary to a lot of people. Um, so we need to work through those hurdles and see what we can do to advocate so that we can take in money via, um, you know, I'm going to say PayPal and Venmo. And, uh, and I'll throw that to Jonathan to say, can you help us work with accounting and legal and anybody we need to so that we can make it so that we can accept money easier? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think as I as I mentioned, Chris, on email, I, I, I think the first step is there probably uh, we probably should have a conversation with Tom Mullen just to make sure from a, a legal standpoint that there aren't any hurdles, um, you know, uh, related to sort of how we collect money as a municipality. I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. And, you know, Tom is, um, you know, kind of my source for any any question on kind of what we're allowed to do from a legal and compliance standpoint as a town. So I, I would definitely leverage that. I, I think that's the first place to start. And then I think tactically we can figure out, um, you know, with the accounting department, how then, you know, if we are able to do online donations, which I, I, I think and hope we should, but again, you know, I, I want to make sure we clear that through uh, through Tom we can then figure out sort of what are the mechanics of doing that and if there's a preferred platform that you know the town already has access to um or you know if it's venmo or something else um you know how we set that up uh, you know the town does do online bill pay which we also do use for things like donations to um the emergency fund and, and things like that so uh, we need to kind of work through the details but there may be a platform that we could use already Again, first step though being, we, I think we just have to check through with, uh, with legal counsel. Okay. I definitely think we're gonna come through legal counsel okay. Yeah. Um, I think that um, there are platforms, keep in mind, I used to work on the other side inside a town hall. So mm -hmm. I, I know the systems pretty well. So I ask these questions in a little way facetiously. Um, I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I know there's a lot of people that are gonna wanna tell us no, cause it just creates a lot of work for them. Yep. And we're going to really need some motivation and we're going to really need somebody to advocate for this. And if they said use the, the, the uni one system, um, really we want to use, and, and, and I'm speaking for everybody, but you know, Venmo, PayPal, we want to go where the people are that, that are going to donate to us. So a uni one solution wouldn't necessarily make sense. Well, it might be functional. It wouldn't make sense. And then the other thing is, and, I, and I'm pretty sure because I know Dan at Recreation pretty well, and, and I've talked to Catherine at the library, um, both of those outfits would benefit from this. And I know that they've both hit the wall uh, as far as um, you know, the finance and accounting folks have basically just said, no, 
but they have other, you know, the, the people and they just sort of said, oh, okay, um, we need somebody to advocate for this and it'll benefit more than just us. Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure we're going where the people are at. If we have a UniPay thing on our website, well, that's cool and actually does it. It's not where our people are. Our people are on Venmo. Our people are on PayPal. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, the, the I mean, the UniPay process is not as user friendly as a Venmo. Um, you know, we'd have would want to look at the fees as well. I, I think we want to do this in a cost effective way. And, you know, um, there's definitely kind of a fee question, you know, as we as we think about like a Unipay or something like that. So I, I'm happy to kind of help, you know, kind of push through that once we once we at least get sort of the legal answer. But I, I would just ask that we start with with the conversation with Tom so that um, there isn't an issue that, you know, I'm just not thinking of or or isn't apparent from, you know, from kind of where we're sitting right now. Okay. Is that something that you can take the lead on and advocate for us? Because I'm honestly just spread too thin. I, I don't know that I can get to it in the next couple of weeks, just given that we're starting to get into, into budget time um, uh, for council. But, you know, Tom's very responsive. So I, I think if you shoot him an email, I mean, you'll hear back from him within a day, I would guess. Okay. Doug, is that something that you could do? Um, probably not the next couple of weeks myself, um, just because work is pretty busy right now. Okay. But I can put it on the list in like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, chances are I'll write an email. Um, what do you call it? To at least get that moving forward. But again, you know, Jonathan, we're definitely going to need an advocate um, yep. uh, in town hall. Um, we need to create uh, the 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 motivation and the desire from from uh, from the players because I've gone down this path a lot of times in the past and I've been shut off, not for necessarily reasonable reasons. Uh, just reasons, uh, at, you know, at the time, and 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 it is going to require, I think, a lot of uh, uh, persistence. Yeah. No, and and I think it's also helpful to hear, you know, if there are conversations you've had with the folks at the library or or with Dan McGrath around sort of, um, you know, some barriers that they see in terms of the payment systems that they're using. I, I think it's also helpful to kind of look at that all holistically, so that. You know, we're not kind of coming up with a system that works for ACE, but, you know, we still have a problem at the library or at the senior center or wherever else where they're, you know, their dollars kind of changing hands. Okay. So everybody's on board with the fact that we should do this. Uh, just we're all spread a little bit thin, it seems like right now. I'll do my best to continue to push it forward. Um, but let's just, you know, do, do what we can do. And if people have time earlier rather than later, um, you know, some assistance on this would be great. Um, then, uh, one other thing regarding the website and, and Kathy, this is something, again, I know everyone's stretched for time. Uh, we, we had talked about, um, uh, or I sent you a message asking about, um, our signup form as we start to get back into our online mode, our current signup form is dated at this point, um, what it says and, and how it's configured. Um, we don't have things on there like you need to have a committee, uh, a, a committee representative for each event that gets approved. We do have lead times in there. We do have capacity stuff in there. Um, there's been a long history with the uh, library as far as how they reserve public rooms. And some people may know about this. Some people may not. Um, there was a white supremacist group that um, rented uh, that reserved rooms in the library many years ago at this point. And uh, they did it fully legally. And uh, then uh, when it was figured out who the group was and the fact that the, the, there was gonna be an increased amount of security required, uh, the FBI got called in, the state police got called in, dog sniffing, bomb sniffing dogs came, uh, came in because this group came in and reserved a room uh, and, the, uh, you know, and they have the right to speak about whatever they want to, but they're a very controversial group. And what ended up happening was there was threats to the building, uh, there was just a, a, a big need for um, increased security and their forms for room reservations didn't cover that. And so what happened was um, they couldn't cancel the reservation uh, due to you know uh, amendment rights and that sort of stuff. But the FBI came in, dog sniffing dogs came in, they, uh, uh, bomb sniffing dogs had to come in um, and a whole bunch of stuff happened so that the process to rent a room at the library is now two pronged. You fill out uh, one form, 
And then when you're approved, there's another form. And part of that form says something like, if for any reason we determine that there's an increased need for security, the, the solicitor will pay for it. If for any reason, any of these awful things that could happen, you know, tend to materialize, it's stated and it's in the form. So, you know, my thought is that we need to learn, learn from the lessons of the past and tighten up our form. Our form is incorrect at this point because some of the information is, is incorrect, but I think it needs a, a, a legal review because as we come online and our building's way, way cooler now, we've got, you know, we've got a sign going on, we've got bathrooms, we've got this stuff. Once word gets out, I expect we're gonna get a lot more inquiry and the pandemic goes away. We're gonna get a lot more inquiries for people that wanna use our space. And we're going to be fielding those, uh, and we need to be prepared for that, and make sure that our forms are right, and that and that we don't get, um, you know, caught being unprepared. So that was something I had mentioned to Kathy. It's something I think that we need to address. Um, you know, in the right now, we've got a show going on, and we're really, you know, because of COVID, we're not really doing much. But you know, as we uh, prepare to get out of the pandemic, um, we should be prepared to make sure that we're legally covered. Um, we're, that we're covered. Does anybody have any thoughts on okay, that? Okay, so, well, I can, uh, yeah, does anybody have any comments or questions? Because I can tell you the little bit of research that I've done. Go for it. Okay, so I, I it would have been helpful to have some of that background information because when I went and looked at the, um, when I went and looked at the library form, you're absolutely correct. There is a there's an eight page document on what you need to do in order to be able to reserve a, uh, to reserve the room. It is a two prong process. You actually have to um, there's a four page in that eight page document. There's a four page room reservation policy, and then there is a three page room reservation form, which must be submitted and approved before you can actually submit a meeting. Reser a meeting room reservation request. So, um, uh, so it, it also looks like it might need to be notarized. Uh, it's not quite clear, but some of the wording looks very legal-ish. So, um, and then step two is once that form has been approved so that the group who is requesting the capability to reserve rooms has been approved, then they can submit a two-page form for a specific room date and time. Um, so it's a very involved process. So I just wanted to highlight that to people. And, and you're right, Chris, there's a lot of great information in there. Um, so one of the, I came away with a couple of thoughts, which I, I don't think we're going to have time to get into tonight. But w one of my thoughts is we need to be very specific about what our requirements are for updating our form, which I think is an, a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> but even before we do that, I, I'm wondering, Jonathan, if there's someone within within the town that would be an appropriate, I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so the AmeriCall must also do, um, is town owned, I believe, and, and has a process. The library has a process. So is there a standard process that we should be following? Um, yeah, and I'll, so, maybe I'll so, just stop there, Jonathan. I, I was actually going to say, I, I would take a look at the, the form and process that the AmeriCall uses. It is a, it is different from the library. I, I think it's, it, okay. it's, um slightly easier <laughs> um but you know they also do have kind of legal, legal language around indemnification and release you know obviously there's there's a fee to use uh to use that space so i i, I think that might be a good example to okay. follow as you think about sort of what you want to do with <laughs> okay. uh with ace I, i'd imagine you know there probably would be sort of a fee that you'd want to charge for for rental similar to like the heritage room at the americall or, or something like that Okay, so what I'm not hearing is that there is a standardized process that any room room or facility rental in the town is following. No, no, as there, as there is know. a different okay. process that the schools run because they manage that. The library has their yeah. own process. Okay. The the right. AmeriCall is probably the, the one that's sort of closest to being kind of town managed given you, that it runs through the okay. rec department. Um, okay. but, but that's probably the one that I, I think is is sort of most analogous. A little more to user what, friendly? Yeah, okay. yeah, and I and I think I, I think it's absolutely appropriate to kind of think about sort of repurpose, repurposing and adapting the form that that they're using okay. for uh, for ACE as well. 
So, Chris, with the background information about some of your, the concerns that you brought up, um, and, and that, that's good to understand some of the background, and then with Jonathan's input on the AmeriCall form is, is probably worth a really good look, um, I, I'll at some point go look at the AmeriCall form, and then I'll come back to this group with um, some recommendations, and, and, we'll, and, you know, I might even reach out to some, you know, one or two people for some specific input, but I'll continue to look at this. How's that? Okay. Awesome. Appreciate uh, appreciate that. I know all these things are hard for everybody, and I know I keep asking people to do stuff. Um, what do you call it? So uh, you know, forgive me. I know I know that uh, it, it takes time, and that these things don't happen overnight. Uh, but just even the idea that someone's going to take ownership on any particular item, even if it takes some months or whatever to do it, um, really helps um, you know uh, transfer off some of the load. Um, yep. So that's, uh, does anybody else have anything else to say about websites, room reservations? Um, the next item on here is- All right, Chris, just, just one other thing. I think, yeah. Kathy, the AmeriCall also does have like a rental policy document um, that they oh, use okay. for that. So that, that's also something, in addition to the form, that's also something that you may want to take a look at. Okay, yeah, I'll poke around there. Uh, presumably they have a website and I can poke around and find something and, and I'll take a look. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Chris. Yeah, no worries. Um, so this, this next item, though, the number 10 is sort of a little redundant on some of the things that we've already talked about. It just says, and this is, this is one of our placeholder agenda items. Um, it just says nonprofit, friends of ACE establishment. That's something that's down the road a little bit. We've got a lot on our plate now, but something that we have out there, um, just about the idea of pairing with that kind of thing. Um, and funding ideas and disabilities commission and, and that sort of stuff and follow-ups with Aaron um Aaron Kokinda um there I don't think there's anything new for us to discuss we've covered it in a lot of our, our previous um items there uh, uh so then switching to number 11 which is basically our last uh, our last item um committee reappointments are coming up um the initial notice went out and it said that we had like four openings uh, which concerned me and I talked to Jonathan about um, because we've always been an unlimited opening um, organization. We've never set a cap to it. Uh, we went back and forth a little bit. Um, I felt that the, um, the publication by the town was misleading. Um, I noticed that they made some changes to it uh, since then where it just says four expiring terms. Um, but the big thing to me was that we didn't have a cap and that we were trying to recruit new people. Um, you know, we've all been working faithfully for, for many years, but you know, We've had a few people come and go, um, and um, you know I've got two people um, that um, that uh, we that are looking to join our committee uh, come April, uh, and that would be Anne Marie Gallivan and Tracy Shea uh, to be new committee members. And so um, I've worked with both of them. I've got resumes from both of them. They're filling out their forms. We're going to have their stuff submitted, um, as well as reappointments came up, uh, and the reappointment list uh, was uh, myself. Kathy, um, Tony, and Doug. Uh, Tony has told me that, uh, what do you call it, he is, he is not gonna seek reappointment. Um, Doug, uh, I haven't talked to Doug about this, but we've been doing stuff left and right uh, for the last two weeks anyways. I'm pretty sure Doug's gonna go I'll for doing, it. I'll be renewing. <laughs> yeah, so we That's need to- not just, going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's just a reminder. Hey, you gotta get your resume together uh, just to give him an updated one. Where am, where am I in the whole thing? Am I out again? No, you got reappointed. You got yeah, reappointed. you got reappointed a, a year or two ago, right, Joy? I think you got I had to write a resume. <laughs> I did have to write a resume. Thank you, Town of Wayne. <laughs> well, this is this is the thing. They've, they've changed the process, and you know, even in communicating with it, sometimes I got you know emails that said, you know, this is the way we always do it, and and that's a lie. The the whole process got changed two years ago. And everyone was up in arms because we were all very confused about it. And then last year we did it. And, you know, this is sort of the third year of the new process, but it's definitely not the way we've always been doing it because it seems to change every year. Um, but um, so Kathy sent in her, her uh, re reapplication or whatever. And I commented back because she didn't include a resume, not because I think she needs to submit a resume. I think it's silly that she needs to submit a resume but I'm just going by the line of the description. The description says you need to reapply, provide a resume. And I don't want us to get into a situation like, 
you know, quite frankly, everybody knows that Joy got sort of screwed around last time. You know, we, we, we didn't know that she was expiring and then we sent her in to be reappointed and then we didn't get answers. And it was a whole just communications nightmare. And then technically Joy was off the committee for a year and she got reappointed the next year. And I'm I, still not listed on the committee. And you're not listed on the because website. I didn't so. have a resume. I have a resume now. <laughs> I do. Joy, you are listed on the website. <laughs> Am I? Yep. All right. Because yeah, there so were the, the places website... where I was not listed because I didn't have a resume. I have one now. Yep. No, ju just so, uh, so folks are aware, and, and, and part of this is some of the cleanup that uh, Jen McDonald, the communications manager, has done. But uh, there is a, a list of, of the seven board members I, that I that looks current to me uh, listed on the website, including when sort of each of your terms expire. So as, as Chris yeah. mentioned, um, four of you, Chris, Kathy, uh, Tony, and Doug have terms expiring this April. Uh, the other three members have terms expiring next April. Um, and who are they, by the way? I'm just curious because, and I just shut my computer off. Yep. Uh, next April is uh, Donna, Joy, and Karen. Okay. Karen Gagney, she's a school yep. teacher. Uh, yep. She's in. She's come. She's come sometimes. She's she's super busy. She she sends me messages from time to time saying that you know she can't make it a lot, but you know keep her in the loop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but, see, we never just... had terms before. You know, like yeah. this whole idea that there was terms, the uh, and that they expire at certain points. We were just appointed. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, and then anyways, it's been a confusing thing. It's going to get better. You know, the first time's always the hardest. We've gone through this two or three times. But the point that I made was that we, you know, the way it was presented was as if there was four openings and we have unlimited openings unless something changes. And I just felt that was misleading. I talked to Jonathan. We talked to uh, Sherry. She's modified that. I think it could be modified better but I'm not offended by it uh, at this point because I just made a very big point of clarification because I'm reapplying, Kathy's reapplying, Doug's reapplying, Tony's not. But I've got two people that want to come on. So if in theory, if we only had four openings, we've got five people that want to be on the committee. And it would just seem silly to restrict ourselves given that we're, you know, a cultural exchange that we, were, we would, we would, you know, restrict ourselves. We want, we want, we want representatives from as many people uh, are available to participate that can participate and are willing to participate. I mean, if we had 25 people that wanted to participate, that might get out of hand, but we have seven people. We could easily have 10, 12, 15, maybe. After, if, if we actually had that many people that wanted to be on this board and we actually had a problem of too many people, but right now I don't think we have a problem. Right now I think we yeah, need a no. couple of people and they need to learn the ropes. When you join this, so, so Chris, Chris, I I agree. What you're saying makes sense. So Jonathan, I don't know is is there is it there's still a debate as to is there a nope. cap on the number of groups? Okay, no, there, right. there is not a cap at all. So um, you know there are certain committees where the the membership of the committee is set in the town bylaws. This is not one of those committees. Um, okay, you know, great. The creation of the committee and the composition of it is ultimately at, at the discretion of what whatever the town council decides to do. <laughs> and certainly, I can't speak for the other members of the council, but you know just given how we've handled appointments in the time that I've been on the council, I, I think, you know, if we have five, six good applicants, and particularly if, if you as the committee say, you know, this is a pool of applicants that we want to bring on board, you know, mm -hmm. we've been pretty deferential to, uh, to groups like, like ACE in doing that. So I, I don't Wonderful. see that there's any issue that we would have in terms of adding individuals um, you know, if you've got a good set of qualified applicants, um, you know, it would be a nice problem to have if there were like 20 applicants. I, I don't think yeah. that'll be the case. So, um, you know, certainly given some of the folks, um, you know, Chris, that you referenced on the agenda and, and given their interest and background and assuming they go through the application process, that, that's absolutely something that we'd consider at the, at the council vote. And again, not to speak for my colleagues, I, I think sure. that folks would be pretty favorable to moving ahead with that. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, especially in this volunteer environment, it's hard to get people to volunteer and we've got, we've got a lot of work to do and, and, yep. and a lot of plans. So to be able to have capacity for this group um, uh, to really engage and, you know, add some additional folks, I think is critical for our success. 
So yeah. thank you. That's that's reassuring to hear, Jonathan. Thank you. No problem. And I, I just think uh, my last statement on this is that we're a cultural exchange. We're all about inclusion, not exclusion. Uh, okay, so uh, the two people that I know that are, uh, in addition to the ones that are already on the board and, the, and, and Tony, who's, who's, who has indicated he's not going to reapply, um, Tracy Shea, um, what do you call it? Uh, she's done work at, with Anne Marie at, uh, at Create, and she's a local mother. She's got kids in the school system, uh, general all around good person. Um, she's interested. She's got her resume together. She's filling out a form that's going in. And then Anne Marie Gallivan. Um, who uh, runs Create and, uh, you know, is part of the Arts Collaborative and has run many shows for us. Everybody knows who Anne Marie is. It's uh, pretty much a no brainer, uh, I would think on that and just qualified people to, uh, you know, to, to have on there. But think about people that you know um, that might be interested if there's other people in the Arts Collaborative that's somebody that you think that, you know, maybe you should pitch it to and sell it, you know, um, as, as, you know, Joy and Kathy, you guys run the Arts Collaborative. Um, if there's a few other people that, you know, that you might want to whisper in their ear and say, hey, you know, you've got until I think February 12th or something. Um, if you want to be on the team, um, you know, we'd love to have you. Um, you know, that'd be great, especially for times that, you know, we can't always make it and just so that we can have quality meetings. And, and represent the community. You know, there's so many people in town Again, it's all about uh, inclusion, not exclusion. So if we can expand out beyond people that we're currently involved in, I think that we're successfully um, hitting our mission of uh, inclusion and, uh, and, and interaction between people of all types. I think that's important. You know, we can't, we can't just have five people that paint pictures and have them run everything. You know, we don't, we don't own it between a tight group of us. We wanna make sure that we're representative. You paint, Chris? Me? Not well. You paint pictures? Is that? Sorry. All right. I'm ready. Are we, are we done soon? We're done. <laughs> okay. I have nothing. I have nothing else. Uh, last item is unanticipated <laughs> topics. Does anybody else have anything that they want to talk about or that they didn't have the opportunity to comment on prior? All right. I appreciate everybody uh, hanging in there. We two hours and eight minutes. Uh, not quite as oh. long as the ZBA meeting. Those things apparently go to like very late. That, that, that's not a standard that you want to try to match, Chris. <laughs> yeah, really, Chris. Yeah. All right, guys, are we all set? So I'm just going to say a quick motion to uh, adjourn. Anybody uh, disagree? No. Nope. All right, seeing none, uh, we are adjourned. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very you much, everyone. Chris. All right. Thanks a Everybody lot, everyone. Have safe. a good night. Thank you. Bye.